Shoulder subluxation occurs in up to 80% of stroke survivors. And this is when there's a partial dislocation of the humeral head, the top part of the large arm bone, out of the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint. This happens most commonly after a stroke in the early phases when the arm is flaccid and there's little to no active movement. Arms are heavy, so when you have weakened muscles and you can't actively hold your arm up against gravity after a stroke, subluxation can occur. So what can we do to reduce shoulder subluxation based on the most current evidence? Well, the first and most important strategy to focus on is motor or movement recovery. Of course, you always wanna to talk to your doctor or therapist before trying any of the strategies that I'm gonna talk about today. The foundation of reducing shoulder subluxation after a stroke is to restore active muscle control, AKA get your arms and your shoulders moving again to some extent so those muscles, tendons, and ligaments can help to support the shoulder joint like they're supposed to do. Research shows us that these motor recovery techniques I'm gonna talk about are the most effective over the long term because they're addressing the underlying root cause, muscle weakness. Now, obviously this is not easy to do, but I'm gonna share three specific motor recovery techniques with you that you can use just one or a combination of all three to meet you where you're at in your recovery journey. The place that I recommend starting with is mental practice, also called motor imagery. And this is where you visualize yourself performing movements with your affected limbs or affected abilities. In this case, we'd be practicing shoulder movement. Research shows us that mental practice actually activates the same brain pathways as doing the actual movement. And this is a great place to start if you have little to no active movement. And when you do have some movement, when you use it in addition to physical practice, exercises or activities, it can really help to accelerate your motor recovery. I recommend starting off your home rehab routine with five to 10 minutes of a mental practice activity of the affected abilities you're trying to regain. So before you start working on shoulder movement, exercises or activities, start with a five minute mental practice activity where you're going through those movements in your mind. The second motor recovery technique is task specific training. And this just means that you're working on real world, meaningful everyday activities that focus on improving your shoulder movement. Instead of solely focusing on exercises, which are important too, engaging in this task specific training of meaningful tasks is going to help rebuild that brain body connection during those everyday activities. For example, this might be practicing reaching for something on a shelf, washing dishes, or even trying to comb your hair. Because the research is clear, our brains prioritize pathways that are familiar to us and that are meaningful to us. And the last technique is high intensity training. Research shows us high intensity exercise and training helps to improve motor recovery outcomes. Now, this doesn't mean that your exercise needs to be painful or dangerous. It just means that you need to break out of your comfort zone and push yourself a little bit harder. And some real world ways that you can think about this are if you're doing 10 repetitions of an exercise, next time try 11 or 12. If you're using two pound weights to work on resistance training, try using three pounds the next time. And in all of your exercises, your activities, any part of your home rehab routine, make sure that you are really being present and giving your full maximum effort and focus during each one that you do. So to reduce shoulder subluxation, focusing on restoring movement is key. But there are four other strategies that you can use in conjunction with these motor recovery techniques to help reduce shoulder subluxation and reduce shoulder pain. Positioning. Proper positioning can help to prevent shoulder subluxation in the first place or keep it from getting worse. This is especially important in the early days after your stroke if your arm is still in the flaccid stage or you have little to no movement. You wanna make sure that your arm isn't just limply hanging down at your side because this will absolutely worsen subluxation. When you have gravity just tugging down on your arm, you're not giving any support to that joint. So when you're sitting, you wanna make sure that your arm is supported at a table or an armrest, and you wanna make sure that you're supporting the entire forearm or at least underneath the elbow and not just at the wrist. If you use a wheelchair using an arm trough or a lap tray, 
When you're lying down, if you're on your back, you can put a pillow up underneath the upper part of your arm to give some support to that shoulder joint. And if you need to lay on your side, lay on your unaffected side, bring your affected arm over and support it with a pillow. Neuromuscular electrical stimulation, also called NMES, uses small electrical pulses to stimulate muscles to contract. And in this case, we'd be focusing on muscles around the shoulder. And this is especially helpful when you can't voluntarily activate your muscles yet. This strategy is most appropriate if you had your stroke less than six months ago, or you have little to no active movement. However, NMES or any electrical stimulation is best used under the guidance of a doctor or therapist. Or you need to learn how to do it from a licensed healthcare professional. Electrical stimulation isn't right for everyone and some people definitely shouldn't use it. You need a healthcare provider who understands appropriate parameters and electrode placements to get the best results and for safety. Kinesio or rigid taping. So these types of taping techniques can actually help to provide external support while you're working on your motor recovery. The evidence shows us that it can provide some immediate improvements in shoulder positioning, as well as a reduction in shoulder pain. And the choice between the two types of tape really depends on the severity of the shoulder subluxation, as well as the available movement that somebody has. For example, if somebody has a more severe shoulder subluxation and less available movement, rigid tape is gonna be better than the softer, more pliable kinesio tape. And the key here is proper application. It needs to be applied by someone who has been trained in the technique. There are actually several different ways that you can apply it, and someone needs to understand what your situation is like in order to apply the best technique. But when it's done correctly, it can help to provide external support to weak muscles. It can help to improve proprioception or your ability to understand where your arm is in space because it provides some extra sensory input and it can also help to reduce shoulder pain. Now you're not gonna use kinesio or rigid taping in isolation. It should be used in conjunction with motor recovery exercises, activities, or even with NMES, electrical stimulation, to get the best results. Slings. So slings should really only be used as a temporary protective measure and not as a primary treatment. It's best used early on when the arm is still flaccid and there's little to no active movement. Current evidence really only supports the use of slings during walking or gait training, and it's sort of iffy on the use of slings during transfers. And the type of sling matters as well. You want to avoid traditional arm slings that put your arm in a more flexed pattern with the shoulder internally rotated. That is a positioning that we really want to avoid. So you can use hemi slings like the Roylan, AlliMed, Otterbach, or Givemore slings. They're more helpful because they're gonna put the arm in a much better position than traditional arm slings. They're gonna allow for more natural movement during gait and activities of daily life while also giving support to the shoulder joint. But the research is clear, slings should not interfere with your motor recovery training. So as soon as you start to develop any active movement in the shoulder, the sling really should come off. So even when you're doing walking or gait training, you should be actively trying to control your shoulder and arm movement as well. So to recap, your primary focus when trying to reduce shoulder subluxation should be on techniques, exercises, and activities that focus on restoring shoulder movement. Specifically, you wanna consider mental practice, task-specific training, and high-intensity exercise. All of the other strategies, positioning, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, taping, and slings should support, not replace, your motor recovery efforts. Because they can help to reduce pain, provide support, and protect your shoulder joint while your brain and your muscles are relearning how to work together. Leave me a comment and let me know what strategies that you've tried to reduce shoulder subluxation and which ones have been most helpful for you. And of course, a huge thank you to all of the donors who make this nonprofit possible, with a special thanks to Heather G, Ryan D, Modus Nova, and Joseph M in our Empowered tier on Patreon. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next time.